Welcome to this new screencast. Uh, this one will be on the first lecture, and um, it will be first part of chapter one of Townsend. And we will start this uh, this lecture uh, talking about the Stern Gerlach experiment. Um, so the 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 outline is like this: we first talk about the Stern Gerlach experiment, then uh, a number of them, and show that uh, a number of results do not quite fit our classical intuition. And starting from there, we try to uh, build a formalism based on cats and uh, v in the vector space of, of quantum mechanics and see how we can build a formalism that could account for those experiments. And uh, this is a formalism that we essentially will build uh, throughout this course. And uh, we'll see that it can account for um, the observation of quantum mechanics and it can be expanded to uh, to other experimental verification. So that's going to be the goal. So before we start with stern gerlach uh, experiment, I'd like to remind you about the uh, angular uh, momentum. This is a concept you should be fam uh, familiar with, since this is essentially a classical um, uh, concept. At least this is the way it was introduced to you. So the classical concept is the, is the one of orbital angular momentum. It's essentially uh, uh, linked to the fact that you have an object that is uh, in, on rotation. For example, the Earth has an orbital momentum, um, both uh, for its spin, so the spin in that case would be classical, and also for its revolution around the, um, the Sun, so that would be another uh, angular momentum. But both of, of those angular moment momentum are classical. There is another type, which is called the spin, so the quantum uh, mechanical part of it, um, th which is really a quantum mechanics concept, and that cannot be um, uh, explained by the rotation of a charge or rotation of an object, as we would see in a, a classical. So we are going to talk a lot about spin in this class. Uh, so at this point, all you need to know is that spin is be does behave for many on many aspects, like an angular momentum that you've seen classically. Of course, there are significant differences, and we're actually going to see already one uh, today, uh, and we will see many more um, as we move towards uh, forward with the uh, formalism for angular momentum in this course. But the point for this uh, to, to start and understand stern gerlach experiment is that if you have uh, angular momentum for a charge, there is automatically a magnetic momentum that's associated with it. And you can understand this fairly easily by uh, remembering the definition of magnetic moment. Uh, the magnetic moment is given by this formula that I, that I have there. We have I, which is the current that's circulating. A is the surface. Actually, in the picture I show on the right, it's, we use a S for surface, but since S will be used for spin, I, I use A in the formula. And we divide the, the speed of light, which is essentially there to, uh, for units. Uh, to work in the um, international system of units. So if we look a little bit more carefully here uh, on this picture, we see there is a rotating uh, object which is, which is charged. And at a distance r, uh, actually at a vector uh, r uh, from the origin, and there is a momentum associated, a linear momentum associated with that motion, since, uh, which is p, since there is a velocity associated with it. So the, the momentum will be m times v, and the total angular momentum, the orbital angular momentum, is r cross p. So the outer product between the position vector and the momentum, the linear momentum vector. So this is, this is pretty uh, straightforward from classical mechanics. Um, the point is, if you now look at the magnetic moment, as I just told you in the previous slide, if you take a the, look at the box on the bottom left, it is related to the current times the surface that's actually swept uh, during, let's say, a period. So you can easily change the current by the charge divided by the period it takes, so the time it takes for the charge to, to go around the circle, times the surface, which is, in this case, we suppose it's going to be a disk, so it's p r square. And things become pretty easily from there because we know that the velocity will be the total distance divided by the time, so it's 2 pi r divided by t. And when I uh, substitute everything in that equation on the on, on, on this side, on the left on, on the left hand side there, uh, and remember that the momentum is mvr, 
because here we're supposing p and r, the p and r vectors are perpendicular to one another, so there is no there is no sign of an angle involved in here. We end up that we can see from this simple analysis that the magnetic moment mu is related to the existence of um, angular momentum, in this case orbital. So we will see that the spin really behaves like an, an angular momentum, and there you can be convinced there is indeed a, a correspondence between magnetic moment and uh, angular momentum from, from this simple analysis. So the point is that if you have an object with an angular momentum, or, um, you will have also, this object will also have a magnetic moment, at least if the object is charged or if there is a quantum mechanical spin, for instance. So this is where we start from. Now, so this is the main, the main message we have uh, that I just, just mentioned in the previous, in a second ago. Now, here is a stringer lash initial device. So this is actually a fairly simple device. We start with, on the left-hand side, with an oven, and we have silver particle in there. And we'll see in a second why we use silver. Uh, there is a, the, the oven, of course, increases temperature, and, and the effect is to have silver atom, which, is, which are neutral, uh, are bombarded uh, to the right-hand side, through the op opening, and then there is a collimator that allows you to have a focused beam. Uh, that focused beam is then uh, propagates to the right and in the vicinity of a uh, magnetic dipole. So you see the north and the south um, electrode of the dipole. I mean, not electrode, uh, pads of the, di of the of magnetic dipole. And something is special about this is that instead of having a f two flat pads, we have one that's tapered, so that you see that on, on from the north, and one that's flat on the south. And the reason why we have that particular geometry is to ensure that we have a non-uniform magnetic field. So the magnetic field is not constant. That's the that's main thing. And we are going to see just a second why it's like this. In fact, we can see it easily, is that if we have a magnetic moment mu, we know that the force on the magnetic moment will be the gradient of the potential energy associated with this. And the potential, pot ener potential energy associated with the magnetic moment in the magnetic field is minus mu dot b. And of course, the force is minus the gradient. Since mu is essentially a constant, by differentiating by, in par by part, we find that the force on the particle that has a magnetic moment mu will be given by mu dot uh, the derivative of the magnetic field with respect to z. This, we are going to suppose that z is uh, the, the, the direction of the magnetic dipole. Okay, so at the end of the day, we find that the force on z will be mu z, so the component along z times the derivative of bz. So that's the reason why we need this particular uh, uh, dip uh, magnetic dipole, so that we have uh, a uh, uh, non-zero derivative and therefore a force. If we had a flat um, uh, dipole moment, a uh, uh, magnetic dipole, um, we, it would not work because Bz would be constant and therefore there would be no force. Uh, in that case, that means that there would be no uh, deflection of the magnetic moment. Now, we, explain, we expect that if we have um, a classical dipole, we would have... Um, a, a classical mu, we would expect that since it would be oriented essentially randomly or, uh, in, for any angle between 0 and 2 pi, that the deflection should be essentially kind of a trace ranging all the way from the minimum to the maximum, but in continuous fashion. That's what we would expect for a charged particle who is a magnetic uh, uh, moment mu. So before we do that, the experiment was like this. If there is no magnetic moment, there is no deflection. So this, this plate there is really uh, rotated 90 degrees in the plane of, of the screen. And you see, in this case, there's absolutely no deflection. Now, if we put this magnetic moment, we find something very interesting, is that there is indeed um, a deflection. They are shown by the two dotted red lines there. Uh, there is a deflection, and I would like you to focus just on the central part of the image uh, the fact that you have a closing on the on the left and right is due to the fact that the magnetic mo the magnetic moment is actually decreasing. So just focus where on the 
part that I, foc I, I highlighted on the screen. The point is, this something very interesting. First of all, yes, there is a deflection. So there is a magnetic moment involved in this experiment. That's one thing. The second thing, though, is that we do not have a continuous uh, deflection of magnetic moment, which w what we would expect from a classical uh, magnetic moment. So let's try to go back to why we use silver in this experiment. We do use silver because silver is an interesting uh, system which has 47 electrons, but all the electrons are, correspond to full uh, shells, electronic shells, but the last one, so the very last, the 47th electron, is a 5s1 electron, and all the others have a magnetic moment or a spin or whatever you want that actually cancel each other in the sense that they, on average the sum of everything is zero. So in other words, the silver atom, the electron of the silver, silver atom, really behave like a single electron. But even better than that, that electron has a total orbital momentum zero because it's an s electron so s electron correspond to l equals zero so that electron does not have a classical orbital uh, angular momentum so everything we can see here comes comes from an another type of momentum and that momentum was actually the spin uh, angular momentum uh, that we that, that has to be associated with the 5s1 electron and the reason why I say it has to be a new quantum mechanical object is because of the fact that we do not see a continuous deflection of uh, silver, but we see discrete value, which are plus one half and minus one half. Actually, the units are age bar because it's a momentum. Uh, but do not worry so much about that. Worry about the fact that we just have two possible projections instead of what of the continuous projection we would expect from a classical moment. So this is where we start from. So we have a perfect, um, a perfect scenario here where we have a fairly simple experiment which allows us to measure a quantum mechanical property of a single electron, which is the, the spin. So let's try to go a little bit further than this. So this is uh, essentially what I write there in the box is, is the, the summary of what I just explained. Now, in, the, to, in, in order to understand what's going on, we need to uh, perform a number of experiments. So we are going to look at a number of experiments now, starting from simple to more complicated, and to see that there is something going on that is definitely cannot be explained by classical physics. So first of all, we are going to model the Stern-Gerlach experiment as a box, as I, we call here SGZ. So SGZ is essentially a Stern-Gerlach experiment where the magnetic uh, field is, so the non-uniform magnetic field is directed along Z. So in that case, we know that uh, with the uh, silver atom coming from the left, they will, uh, they will get into the Stern-Gerlach uh, apparatus and there will be a deflection of two beams. One corresponding to plus h bar over two and the other one corresponding to minus h bar over two. And in this experiment, we are going to just stop the beam of those gold atom, that uh, uh, silver atom, sorry, that correspond to minus h bar over 2. That's what we do. That's what it means uh, there on this experiment. So we have prepared silver atoms that all correspond to the upward deflection. That's basically what this experiment does. So we're going to add a piece. We are going to put in series another stern gerlach uh, apparatus to see if we can further deflect this, this, um, this atom. Well, it turns out when you do this, you find that all those silver atoms that were selected by the first turn gas experiment still behave like they are plus h bar over 2 projection. Because there is no silver atom that gets deflected as they were minus h bar over 2. This is not a big surprise. You have, as explained during the lecture, you have some monsters with green socks and red socks. The stern galash experiment select the green socks on the top, the red socks on the bottom. Then after that, you try to filter again. And of course, from a classical standpoint, the green socks, the green sock mon uh, monsters are still green sock, uh, sock monsters. That's what we see in this experiment. So nothing really too fancy here.
Okay, but you know, something that's kind of put a reference frame. Now here is the experiment number two. The experiment number two, again, we are uh, selecting all the green sock monsters, but we do something different. Now we take another sternger lash experiment and we use a dipole, uh, we use a magnetic, mom, uh, magnetic field that is oriented in another direction. So let's not worry so much about spins, spins for now, it doesn't really matter. The point is we are looking at another property in each case, which is the projection of the spin um, angular momentum along the x direction. So think about our green sock monsters and red sock monsters as having a yellow hat or blue hat, just like I did in the lecture. Uh, all right. So now when we do that, we find that about half of the green sock monsters are deflected as uh, are shown to have a blue hat and other half have a yellow hat. Again, not really surprising because our population of monsters to start with was pretty much uniformly distributed. So, so far, so good. This is our experiment number two. Now, here is experiment number three, and this is th where things get a bit more complicated. We do the same thing. We just select uh, these guys here, and we have, the, so the first Sternger-Lash apparatus select the green sock monsters, and the second apparatus select the, let's say, blue hat monsters. So classically, what we expect to have is that at the end of this uh, experiment, we end up with monsters which have green socks and blue hat, right? That's what we've done. This is not very surprising. I mean, classically, that's what you have. This is kind of, of boring. So now that means that if I going through another Sternger lash Z, which remember, it's essentially making a difference between the green socks and the red socks. So it deflect the green socks on the top and the red socks on the bottom. If we had a pure classical system, we would expect to have all the monsters that we have selected thus far to be deflected on the top as being having green socks, correct? So that's what our classical intuition would tell us. Well, it turns out that when we do this experiment with electrons, with spin, we have a very surprising result. The surprising result is that ha after we have measured the color of the hat, if we try to remeasure the color of the socks, we go back to 50% red socks and 50% green socks. This is an extremely surprising result, completely counterintuitive, at least from a classical standpoint. So that means that we are really now looking at a quantum mechanical property that defeats the analysis from a classical standpoint. And this is really what shows you that we are dealing with a completely different kind of object now than we would if we were looking at a classical property. So this is what we do in this experiment. Now, one thing that we could do as well, and this is gonna, this is gonna be something we'll use for experiment number four, is to create an object that we call a modified Sternger lash, which correspond in which consider that we first the first set of the first magnetic field on the left hand side deflect spin up on the top, spin down on the bottom, and then the second uh, magnetic moment, which operates for a longer time, deflect back down the upward. The, 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 the top deflection and back up the bottom deflection twice as much as they would if, um, if the, the previous uh, magnetic uh, field simply because it's a longer uh, apparatus, longer Sternger lash. And then at the end, we actually bring back everything together by having another Sternger lash experiment like the first one. So I let you analyze this uh, at, uh, um, just from a simple classical standpoint here. And you can understand that what we are really doing is start with our starting beam, separate the, let's say, the green sock and the <laughs> red sock, and then put, back, put them back together. And then we st stuff all this in one black box. So essentially, for all practical purpose, you have no idea what's happening because what comes in and what goes out is essentially the same. It just turns out that we have separated them, the, the two population, inside the box without ever looking at them. Okay, that will be the modified stern lash experiment. And we will see there is a beautiful uh, mathematical expression that 
correspond to exactly what this is doing. And we will we will see that probably in a in a future lecture lecture um, maybe in a couple of weeks. Okay, so let's go to experiment number four. The experiment number four using a Stern-Gerlach experiment, uh, just like before, and uh, select all the spin one half on the top. And then we use a modify Stern-Gerlach experiment, but here for X. So essentially think about the monsters. We have the first box, the very first box on the left, select all the green sock monsters. And the first, uh, the second object somehow um, separate the blue hat and the yellow hat, but then put them back together in the box. Okay? So, for all practical purpose, you could say that it doesn't do anything, but, but with a big difference, that you are actually separating the blue hat and the yellow hat inside the box. And then after that, you remeasure the color of the socks with SGZ. Now, you would think, uh, based on experiment three, that because we separated the blue hat and yellow hat, that maybe we have, we no longer what, we know what the color of the socks are. That's what experimental, experiment three had done before. Well, in this experiment, it appears that when you do, when you try to filter out, again, the color of the socks, we find that all the socks are green socks. So completely different output as we had in experiment three. And we will see that the main, the reason, of course, I'm kind of giving you the answer without explaining it, but we will explain it. What happens is the modified stern gerlach experiment in the center, uh, we never knew what color of the hat each particular electron had. We don't, we don't know that. We just know that we've separated them, but we never knew that information. So the fact that we, 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 we never had a problem to know at the same time a color of the hat and a color of the socks, which was, not, which was different from experiment three. Okay? So, we are, so this is where we are. We have these four experiments. Some of them are counterintuitive from a classical standpoint. Some others are completely... Uh, weird, I would say, or mysterious. And we are going to try to build a formalism to explain this, and then we will build from there. The advantage of this approach, of course, is that we are just dealing with two properties for each box. So we do, we, each time we only have two possible states coming out of the box, which makes our life much easier. But it turns out expanding this uh, two-state uh, approach is, is really not very complicated because the formalism is no, no more difficult for 10 states than it is for two states. So we, that's what we will do. So in order to, to, to start working on this, we need to, to, to set up a, a, a framework. And the framework, we, we have to know where we work. And we are going to work in what's known a quantum state vector. So I just, I don't want you to be confused and start to mix up things from what you know before. So don't, do not rely too much on what you know from classical physics, but we are, but we are, because we are going to work in a different, in different space. And the space we are going to work in is called the quantum state space. People know it as a Hilbert space. Uh, I'm just giving the name here so that you, you know how to connect to what you read. But the point is that we have, this is a world where quantum state live. And those vectors have a name. We call them the ket, for reasons that are going to become obvious in a couple of minutes. And the ket is a vector that, that includes every single information you could ever know about the system in, of interest. All right? OK, so it's a lot of text on this, on this uh, slide. But the, the, main, the most important information is the shorthand notation. The shorthand notation is using this symbol there with a bar and then some label and then a larger than, which essentially implicitly include all the information. But we are only going to label the states according to the information we know. So for example, if a silver atom comes out of a Stern-Gerlach experiment SGX, so where we measure the X component of the spin, then if it comes from the top channel, which is a plus h bar over 2, 
we are going to call that state plus x. If it comes from the bottom uh, uh, channel, we'll call it minus x. Of course, there are other properties, but since my experiment does not allow me to measure them, I can't say anything. So I'm just going to use uh, that notation. OK, so let's let's try to, to move from here. Um, now, we have a space and this is a space, a vector space. And what we really would like to do now is to be able to manipulate objects. So the same way we've done classically when we work in the Cartesian uh, space, we have a three dimensional uh, space, at least in uh, non relativistic uh, physics. And what we want to do, of course, most of the time is to use a set of axes X, Y, Z. And usually what you feel comfortable with, what I feel comfortable with are the coordinates of an object. In other words, instead of working with formal vectors, I like to work with vectors that, ha that have a certain representation in a given basis. And for that, all I'm doing is to pick up an, a set of axes, X, Y, Z, and I refer to the position of the end of the vector by the different projections of that vector on the axis. So this is something you've been doing. In fact, using projection like this is something that you've been doing um, since forever, even before you knew mathematics was, was, was something that existed, because you always look at projection. In fact, um, this is the perception of saying how far you are ahead, far, how far it is above, on the left, on the right. So this is really about projections. So we need to find a basis. So just like we do class in classical physics, we need to find a basis to be able to project the vectors in the quantum space. So we are going to work on this. Now, the basis is what? The basis is basically uh, is the set of vectors that we know well, that we've decided that are sufficient to represent everything. This is what a basis, this is. What a basis is. Well, in our stern galash experiment, so for example, the stern galash experiment with the magnetic field along Z, so we call, it, we call that SGZ, we know that the only possible outcome of that experiment is to either have a deflection with a plus h bar over 2 or a deflection with minus h bar over 2. In other words, I should be able to represent every ket that corresponds to that experiment as a, comp as, a, as a linear combination of plus z and minus z state. Indeed, there is no other state that do, does not, is not included in those two deflections. So they are certainly sufficient as a basis. So this is, this is going to make our life easier because in, in, instead of using, with an abs, using an abstract concept of vector, we are going to look at the, the, the coordinate on a given basis. Okay? So, so far it's fairly trivial. So we are going to, um, to, to, before we can move on, and I'd like to introduce you a, a very important concept of probability amplitude. And this is where you're going to understand why we are using the notation we are using. So if a particle comes out of, from the top channel of an SGZ apparatus, we call that state that comes out of there a plus Z state, you know, with the notation there on the first bullet point of the slide. And we know from experiment number one that if a state is in plus, plus Z, so in a ket plus Z, and then if we use that state and try to measure again the projection of the spin in along Z for that particular in input, there is a zero probability that the output will be in minus Z. I would say that even though you can clearly state that this makes sense, I'm not even asking you to think it makes sense. I'm just telling you that this is what the experiment tells us. So we have to be really careful about what we think makes sense at this point, since we are working in a completely different space where some rules of classical physics do not apply. So let's try to really stick to what experiment tell us. But experiment number one at least tell us something that we feel comfortable with, is that the probability of finding the plus z state in a minus z state is zero. This is what the experiment says. So we are going to write this, uh, as the second bullet shows, as minus z plus z equals zero. So I'd like you really to think about how to read this in English. This notation there means 
what is the probability of finding a plus z state in a minus z state? Okay, so this is the way you read this notation that looks a little bit weird at, at first, but you will, it will save you a lot of headache uh, as we manipulate those objects. So if I have a ket plus z, the probability of finding that ket plus z in the ket minus z is given by that notation there, and it's of course zero. On the other hand, you can ask yourself, what's the probability of finding the ket plus z in the ket plus z? Well, turns out that probability is 1, 100%. So that's exactly what it means there. So if you write using our new notation, plus z plus z equal 1. So, so far it's a notation. Do not get concerned by saying, oh, I don't understand that notation. This is a notation that is very little to understand. This is just a notation we introduced for the English sentence, what is the probability of finding plus z in a state plus z? So this is just a shorthand, okay? All right. Now, let's go to experiment number three and to see if we understand something here. Suppose that my, sp my particle is in the state plus x. Again, what is that ket? That ket corresponds to a vector in this quantum vector space that of which I know one information. And the information I know is that it, when I put it in an SGX experiment, it's going to be deflected upward. This is my plus x state. Okay. What the experiment tells me is that when I use that plus x state and I introduce it to an SGZ apparatus on the right hand side, there is a there is a finite probability of finding it in either a plus h bar over 2 sz projection or a minus h bar over 2 sz projection. In other words, and this is the red box there, my plus x state can be written as a linear combination of a plus z state and a minus z state with some coefficients c plus and c minus that we are going to calculate in a minute. So this is just saying that my plus x state can be written on the basis of that's made up of plus z and minus z. And of course it makes sense. It of course makes sense because the only possible outcome is sgz are plus z and minus z. Now you can tell me, well, why don't I use a plus x minus x basis? And I'm, I'm going to answer you, you could. That's absolutely fine to use a plus x minus x basis. But in this particular experiment, because we measure the SGZ component at the end of the experiment, it's easier to use a plus Z minus Z basis. But we can actually use any basis we want as long as we can do calculation. Okay? All right. So this is what we have. So in general, any ket psi can be written as a linear combination of plus Z minus Z. And again, let me remind you what this means. This means that if I take a stern girlash experiment that measures the projection of the spin on the z axis, the only possible outcome of that experiment is to find a deflection corresponding to a plus z state or a minus z state. This is what that particular equation in the red box means. All right. Now, we usually call that basis of plus z minus z, we will say that it's complete. It's complete because I can represent any vector on that basis. That's what it means. So it's important to have a complete basis. If I don't have a complete basis, I can't represent my vectors. For, for example, in Cartesian coordinates, if I'm in three-dimensional space and I only have the x and y axis, I'm missing out. I'm, I have no idea what is the z component. In other words, that basis is incomplete. So we always need a complete basis. Okay. Now, here we go. We still don't know what are the coefficients c plus and c minus. And classically, we call them projections. And the projections that we, we know, we call them dot products, right? A dot product is a projection. When you do the, project, the dot product between two vectors, you are really projecting the first vector on the second one. OK? And remember, I introduced this notation plus p plus q with uh, when I actually kind of invert the sign, you know, instead of having a larger than a sign, I have a less than sign. And it turns out that I introduce what we call the, the, the ket plus q. And now I'm going to introduce the bra vector 
which is noted as written on the second bullet there. And the reason why we do this, and it's a direct notation, it's, which is going to, it's really nice because it's really compact and, and, and very useful. It allows me to write the projection or the prob or probability, as I discussed a second, as a bracket. Okay, so the bracket plus p plus q is the projection of the state plus q on the state plus p. In other words, using what I told you five minutes ago, this is the probability of finding the state plus q in the state plus p. So that's really nice because it's a number, obviously, so plus p plus q, in, written like in the second bullet, is actually a dot product, it's a, it's, it's a projection of a state on the other. So, you know, we are starting to get out, give ourselves a few tools in this vector space from quantum mechanics. They will come very handy as we move along. So, uh, it turns out that we could use, instead of using the vector space, the quantum vector space uh, that's populated by cats, we could use the quantum vector space that's populated by brass. And this, this is called the dual uh, space. Um, it turns out the information we have in the dual space is exactly the same as information in the primal. In fact, when I say exactly, there is, it's, there is a one-to-one -one mapping. We do not lose anything. However, uh, we actually introduce this dual space so that when I combine, um, in this way at least, in the dot product, I can combine object from one space and pro object from the other one to make this dot product. We will also see how the product later which allow us to not create a number or a scalar, but also create a projector, but we, uh, we uh, projector or, or operator in general. But don't worry about that just yet. Okay, so let's try to move on from there. So we are making really good progress. We have a vector space that we that where Ket lives, and we created another vector space where Bra lives. And these are and when I combine them, I can com calculate the, the projection of one on, on the other, which corresponds to the probability. Um, amplitude to finding of finding one state on the other. Okay, so we call them the bra and the bracket notation. Of course, is kind of a, uh, an easy way to remember what we are doing. And the last bullet, of course, is the is also important. Is the probability amplitude of finding a particle uh, in a state psi in the other state uh, in a state phi in a state psi. Okay. Now. Here is a question I have for you. Uh, we uh, we still um, we we go back now to what we this, we said a couple of slides ago when we said that a state can be written as a linear combination of this basis state plus z minus z. Now the question is, what is the probability of finding the state psi in a state plus z? Well, you know it. I just explained to you the notation is to transform the ket plus z into a bra plus z and then project it on psi. And this is what this is. This is going to be the probability of finding the state psi in the state plus z. Well, and I just operate on the left and on the right of the equation there in the white box. That's what I get. And so the last equality on the right comes from the fact that the probability of finding plus z on plus z is 1. And the finding, the probability of finding minus z on plus z is zero. And do not tell me it makes sense. The answer, the answer is that it was stern collage experiment number one. So in other words, what we find there is that the coefficient c plus is the is the probability of finding the state psi and plus z. Obviously, you can do the same exercise for minus z, and you find that the coefficient minus z is the probability of finding the state psi in minus z. Okay, so all in all, we can r simply write uh, the most important result, which is on the first line and the s after the second e uh, equal sign, is that my state can be written as a linear combination of plus z and minus z state with those projector. projector. And I remind on the second line on this slide that it's nothing else than what you've done classically, where you just project things on the different vectors. Uh, of different basis vectors. This is the same thing. Okay. Um, I'd like to tell you one thing here. Uh, there is nothing to t that tell us that those numbers, those probability amplitude, should be real numbers. Okay. In fact, you could try 
and use real numbers and build all the quantum mechanics this way, and you will find that, that this formalism could not reconcile the fact that those numbers are not real, uh, could be real. So it turns out those numbers are complex. And, uh, and then, you know, what's the worst that can happen to us is that we suppose they are complex and then we find they don't have to be complex when we build uh, this formalism. So, but for now, just to make our life, uh, just to keep our options open, let's suppose they are complex numbers and they can take on complex values. Okay. Now, before we can move on, I just quickly told you that uh, we need to live both in the, 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 the space vector of Ket and the space vector of Bras. So Ket live in one space, Bras live in another space. Okay, and when they meet, they create a scalar. So far, at least, we, there is another way that can, they can meet, but for now, that's what they do. So suppose that you have a general state psi that I explained to you, so C plus plus Z, C minus minus Z, and now I would like to calculate what is the corresponding bra that corresponds to that cat. So of course the good news is I can use a basis, the plus Z minus Z of bras in this space. That's what I wrote there. And we have the coefficient C plus prime and C minus prime. And so what we, we know, we expect that there will be, a there will be some relationship between the C, C plus prime and the C plus we calculated two slides ago and so on and so forth. But let's try to see if we can do that. But we will need that, to, we will need that. So, um, and of course to find C plus prime and C minus prime, all I need to do is to project on the right hand side with a ket plus Z and minus Z. So please verify that you understand where those two lines come from. Um, by now, it should be pretty obvious if you use the English part of uh, those notation. I mean, the English translation of the mathematics should come automatically. And you find a C plus prime is the probability of finding plus Z on Psi, and C minus prime is probability of finding minus Z on Psi as well. Okay, so I can write my uh, bra vector just like in the red box right there. Okay. So nothing really fancy because the C plus without the prime was just the same, but where we inverted the two things. But they, maybe there is, there is some relationship between them. And this is what we are going to do now. So what's the relationship between these two projections? Okay. If these guys, uh, well, let's not say anything about real versus complex. <laughs> we are going to see in a second what it is. Okay. So before we can move on, we are going to require that the state vector psi has a norm of one. That makes sense, right? That means that, in fact, it's a property of the Hilbert space that has to be, in, uh, we can normalize every vector. It turns out that it makes sense because if, we, if I write psi psi that way, it's simply saying, what's the probability of finding psi if I have psi? Well, the probability is one, obviously. So it has a norm of one, that's what it means. Okay. Well, calcu let's calculate it. Now, so if I want to do, if I use my representation of psi and I, and I dot product with the bra psi, I end up with that equation. It is has to be equal to one. So I see that the product of these two numbers that I'm trying to relate to one another plus the product of the, other two, the two numbers that are, that are also, that I want to relate to one another, the sum of those two is equal to one. So the sum of those two products must be a real number, okay? So one easy thing to do would be to consider, it seems obvious to me that in order to ensure that this sum is real, right? It seems obvious to me that if I decided that the two set of brackets were just related to one another by a complex conjugation, that would save my life because that would obviously impose that each product is real, therefore that gives, that ensures that the sum is real as well, okay? So in other words, if I write it this way, that, that one projection is simply the complex conjugate of the other projection, I end up with real numbers and I'm, and I'm all set. That's, that's kind of nice, okay? Um, you can also argue, well, if I had picked real numbers to start with, I'd be, in, I'd be okay. Yeah, sure, you'd be okay, but then you would end up with other problems later on that would not be able to reconcile the Stern-Gerlach experiment. 
So we see that the coefficient now would be related by a complex conjugation. OK, so we are doing very good. So what we've done so far, we can go now from the ket space to the bra space. And I need to do that if I want to do projection simply by changing the bra into kets and changing the numbers from one number to its complex conjugate. That's how we go from one side to the other. And then, of course, we can put it all together. And then we find that we have, of course, this uh, relationship where I, where I replace my definition of the complex conjugate. And we find that the, in that case, we can find a way to normalize the, wave, the, the, the ket state. We, and uh, we can actually understand this equation very much by saying that the probability, the total probability, um, if I sum the probability of finding my state in minus z plus the probability of finding my state in plus z, I should have one. And this comes directly from the fact that my basis is complete. So in other words, when I do a Stern-Gelash experiment, SGZ, I'm sure that if I sum the probability of finding the particle in plus z and the probability of finding the particle in minus z is equal to one. And I'd like to really attract your attention to the fact that what sums to one is not the probability amplitude, which are simply the bracket, but it's the probability itself, which is the square of the modulus of the bracket. OK, so that's an important result. So we can meditate a little bit now. OK, we can meditate because we find that any state which represent the state of a single particle is not a pure state. In other words, there is a, it's a, we have a probabilistic interpretation here of the problem, which says that we never know if the state psi corresponds to a plus z or a minus z. It corresponds to plus z with some probability and to minus z to a some probability. And I'd like to really insist on the fact this is not a statistical effect. It doesn't come from the fact that we have a distribution of silver atom going through the collimator. No, it comes from a single particle. In fact, if we can do the experiment with a single particle, this is still true. There is a probability that that particle will be deflected up and the probability is going to be deflected down. This is totally different and in departure from classical mechanics. So before I, I uh, conclude this, um, this uh, screencast for, for today, I'd like uh, you to think about this example uh, one, one from the book. Uh, in this case, we provide you a state psi that's, of course, written on the basis plus z minus z. And notice that if I have a ket on the left, I have kets on the right. We don't mix ket and bras. And we are measuring as z. So in other words, we are looking at the projection on the z axis. And for that, we are going to make a, a measurement of using an SGZ apparatus. And the, the probability of finding plus Z will be obtained by projecting out with the, the bra plus Z and the, pro the bra minus Z and taking the square modulus. So I can see directly here what happens is that the probability of finding that particle in the plus Z deflection, it would be one quarter, right? It's one half square. And the probability of finding this particle in the other direction will be 3 quarter, which is the modulus square of i square root 3 over 2. OK? And of course, we see 1 quarter plus 3 quarters equal 1, which is great. It simply is telling us that, indeed, a particle can either go upward or downward, and there's no other fancy uh, deflection that it can have. Um, so what we've done so far is study the stern gerlach experiments. And uh, we realized from those experiments that there was a need for a new paradigm, a new formalism to try to understand um, the result of the stern gerlach experiment. And for that, we, we essentially created a world which is the quantum space. And uh, we populated that world with cats. And we realized that by doing that, uh, we could also create a quantum world uh, populated with bras. And uh, that would that allow us to, to calculate brackets. And the bracket uh, probability amplitude of an event to take place. And that allowed us to, to have a formalism, which so far is pretty much compatible with all the Stern-Gerlach experiment we've done. So now um, we are going to keep working a little bit. And um, 
since we see that there is a probabilistic uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics, it seems to make sense that we want to use some uh, tool from uh, probability theory. And one of them we are going to work with now is the expectation value. So when we make a measurement, we want to know the expectation value. And I want you to understand that when we talk about expectation value in this uh, case, we are really talking about expectation value for the experiment performed on a single particle, in this case, uh, silver atom, not on a collection as we would have in a statistical, mechanical, uh, statistical mechanics approach. So as you know, the definition of expectation value is the sum of each possible value times its probability. And the way it's, uh, the notation we use, we use this, this sort of brackets with that uh, very, quite different from the brackets we've seen so far. And that notation, like it's shown there on the second bullet, is clear. This is a, the expectation value of that measurement. You will, we will talk about operators soon, but we don't need to introduce them just yet. Um, and it's always that, that expectation value is really always related to a state, to a given state. And this is what, what we are going to see uh, soon. So the expectation value will simply given by this formula on the right in the box. Uh, there's not, nothing really crazy. Uh, we have uh, uh, on the right hand side, we see that we have the probability of finding the plus z state times the, the value we get, which is h bar over 2, times the probability of finding the minus z states times minus h bar over 2, which is that uh, value that we would get for the magnetic moment in that case. So of course, when we do that, we find that uh, we have a zero. So the expectation value for that particular uh, object, for that particular system, is, uh, is, is zero. So that's interesting because the expectation value of that measurement is zero, even though the only possible realization are minus h bar over 2 and h bar over 2. In other words, the expectation value is actually never measured. That's not r nothing really um, unusual or, or, or quantum mechanical about that. It's just, it's just the way that probability works. Okay, so that's what we've done so far. Now, we are going to introduce something different, which is the uncertainty. So the uncertainty, and, and of course, you've done quantum physics in the past, and we always hear about the Heisenberg principle, uncertainty pr principle, and so on. And this is really the, the kind of, the, that kind of uncertainty that we are talking about. This is going to become much more clear as we move uh, along with this course. So the uncertainty, it's to be understood as a standard deviation, is basically a measurement of how far we are from the average. Of course, the average is the expectation value. So the uncertainty, for example, if you measure h bar over 2, the uncertainty will be h bar over 2 because the expectation value is 0, right? So the square of the uncertainty is the sum of the square of how far we are from the average. Okay, this is a mouthful, but uh, mathematically it's much easier to understand. The square of the uncertainty is simply the expectation value of how far we are from the average. It's exactly what is written on the first line of that equation there. And of course, uh, if you manipulate this a little bit, you find that the square of the uncertainty is simply the expectation value of the square minus the square of the expectation value. This is a well-known result. It's a good idea to remember it uh, because we are going to use it very often. So let's try to see uh, an, for ex an example, for example, plus the plus x state. And we remember for the plus x state, uh, we we can easily calculate the expectation value of the square of the measurement of, of, of Sz, uh, so simply just as we did in the previous slide, but in this case we square the, um, the realization. Yeah, this is what it means when we say the expectation value of S square. What is the expectation value of the square of the momentum? Well, it's always h bar square over 4 uh, for both cases, both for the plus Z and minus Z. So at the, end of the, at the end of the day, we, get, we find an expectation value, which is, um, which actually, it's, uh, it's uh, h bar square over 4, okay? So um, we've, we find that uh, the, the expectation value of the square is h bar uh, square over 4. Now, the uncertainty, of course, is go simply going to be obtained as a square root of the difference between uh, that value minus the square of the expectation value that we found before. In any case, at the end of the day, the uncertainty is measured as h bar over 2. Uh, we are not going to talk about standard deviation here because standard deviation is really a concept for 
an ensemble of particles. Here, this uncertainty is true for a single particle. I'm going to remind you that over and over. The uncertainty that comes into quantum mechanics is not related to the fact that we have a distribution of results because we uh, it, it, it does not come out because we have an ensemble of results. It, com it comes out for, for a single particle as well. Okay, so we can ask the question, what is the uncertainty of measuring SZ when the state is in plus Z? Well, intuitively speaking, the uncertainty is zero. We know exactly what would be the outcome of measuring SZ, so the magnetic moment along Z, when the state that we start with is plus z. Remember, this was nothing else than the experiment number two, the stern kalash experiment number two. And indeed, if you run, out, if you run the calculation for this, uh, you will see that it is zero, right? Simply because the square of the expectation value is h bar square over four, uh, and the, the, the expectation value square is also h bar square over four. So the difference is zero, therefore the uncertainty is zero. Okay? So that's very clear that we have this. The probability amplitudes, if you remember, they represent the coefficient of uh, a representation of a state g using a given basis. So this is going to become hopefully uh, clear. So before we do that, let's try to think about experiment number three prime. In this case, experiment number three prime is exactly the same as experiment three. But we have replaced an SGX by SGY. SGY simply means that we have rotated the, the, uh, the magnetic field by 90 degrees compa compared to X. So obviously the physics is exactly the same, uh, but instead of, def uh, instead of measuring SX, we are measuring SY. So the deflection takes, takes uh, place along the variation of the magnetic moment, which is along Y. So what I'm trying to say when I write this is that we spent some time in the previous lecture to, to show that uh, the, the state X, so the, bra, the, the ket X that comes out of SGX can be written as a linear combination of the state plus Z and minus Z coming out of SGZ. Oh, clearly, we can call the state coming out of SGY as the Y ket, and we can also express that Y ket as a linear combination of the plus z and minus z. And that combination will be very, very um, similar to the one we, find, we found for x. In fact, if you remember for x, we, we used the we, we use uh, phase factor. So we had ei delta plus and ei delta minus. And we did that because there was no way from experiment that we could know what the phase factor were. So the difference between the plus y state and the plus x state is really the phase factor. Right, because it's also 50% chance to find a plus z, 50% to find a minus z um, when we measure SGZ from with a plus y state as an input of the SGZ apparatus. Okay, so that's that's what we want to have here. So we can also write the bra corresponding to the ket, and again, just a reminder: we every every ket becomes a bra, every complex number becomes its complex conjugate. When we use exponential, of course, this is pretty easy. We just have to change the sign of the phase. Okay, that's all we have to do. Now here is two experimental five, experiment five. So on the top, this is experiment three. So again, experiment three, we have a plus z state that gets into an SGX. We only select the plus x state that come out of that box. And then we find that it has 50% SG, the uh, uh, magnetic moment uh, pointing up and 50% pointing down. Now the experiment number three, the two first boxes are exactly the same and we also select only the plus x state, but instead of having an SGZ apparatus after that on the right hand side, we actually introduce an uh, SGY apparatus. So we measure the uh, magnetic moment along the y axis. And again, we find two values and those two values are plus h bar over 2 minus h bar over 2. And obviously, by now, you're not going to be fooled by this. You find that you have 50% chance to go on the top and 50% to go on the bottom. So in other words, you should be able to express the plus x state, which, has it, which was the input of SGY, as a linear combination of plus y state and minus y state with um, probability, uh, probability coefficients, so no, no probability amplitude, but the square of them being 1 half. 
Okay, so that's what we are going to do. So in other words, you have this. So if you write this, if you want to read that equation in plain English, it means that the probability of finding the plus x state in the plus y state in the SGY apparatus is one half. Okay. So we can also write the bra plus x. This is what we've done last week, again, after experiment number three. So that would explain experiment number three. And we have the phase factor again. So now we have everything we need because we just expressed the bra, the, uh, actually I meant here to remember how to write the ket uh, plus x. It's a mistake, of course. Um, but we know how to write the bra uh, y as well. So when we do that, we um, include, uh, we can just calculate the probability amplitude and, and I'm not going to go into the detail, it's, it's pretty uh, elementary uh, calculation and I, I really invite you to do that. Uh, and we have used the relative phases uh, in that expression. Of course now we know something about the square and again this looks a little bit uh, impressive but it's, it's really no big deal to calculate these things. We find at the end of the day that the probability amplitude the probability, sorry, is simply given by one half times one plus the cosine of the difference between the difference of the phases. So two things that are important here. First of all, there is no, uh, the overall phase of a, of a given ket does not matter. Really what matters is the relative phase of one ket compared to another. This is the reason why the only argument that we find in this expression is delta minus gamma, okay? If we had a term in delta and a term, or a term in gamma alone, that would be a different story. But what this is saying is that the overall phase does not matter. Okay? So we see that the only way that this, can be, this expression can fit the experimental result is for, for delta minus gamma to be equal to plus or minus pi over 2. Okay? And of course, when we do that, if we go back to, to the expression for the... Um, plus x and my, uh, plus y state, we obtain the following. So I'm going to spend a couple of, of minutes to explain how we get to this slide here. So on the top right hand side, this was the expression, the general expression we had from experiment three. And experiment three did not allow us to find the phases. Now, we just found that between x and y, all I really need to worry about is a phase difference between the difference, okay? So we could, that, that makes sense. So we, in other words, we have to use a reference point and we are going to use a reference point for X. So we are going to decide a little bit arbitrarily, to be honest, that delta plus and delta minus are equal to zero. We can do that because we are just giving the phases uh, here. So we are going to suppose that the coefficients are real. All right. So this is okay so far, so long as we are careful of what we do with the Y uh, equation. So since the overall phase does not matter, we can certainly put one of the two states equal to a real number. And now we are imposed for the second number to be a complex number. And the, the complex number would be pi over 2. So this is, there is no mystery here. I just invite you to, to uh, rewind for a couple of slides and find that the general expression of, of plus y5. Okay, so we are making good progress. So here is another example from, that we can work out from the book to, to compute the probability of a measurement. And again, this should not be too surprising to you. The probability of finding measurement SY yield h bar over 2, that means that we obtain the state plus y. So all you need to do now is to, to write the bra plus y, uh, as we just calculated, and calculate the probability amplitude, the bracket plus y phi and then we obtain the result. Uh, the result is shown here, and I'm going to go very quickly on this. Um, we find that uh, uh, we, we just use the, the bra vector there, the third equation that is on this slide, and we just calculate the bracket. And when we do that, we obtain uh, the square of the amplitude, and we find a certain number, and, uh, which is 0 0.93. And then we can calculate also the expectation value for that measurement by multiplying that number, 0 0.93 by h bar over 2, which is the, uh, the magnetic moment corresponding to plus y, and 0 0.07 times um, minus h bar over 2. So why do I use 0 0.07? Well, because I know that the total probability should be equal to 1. So since I have 0 0.93 for the plus y state, 
I certainly have 0 0.07 uh, probability for the minus y state. So the, here, the only complication really is to remember that when you calculate the bra, you have to use the complex conjugate of the coefficients. If you don't, everything gets wrong. Okay, so now it's time to move to a summary of, the ch of chapter one. We're almost done already with chapter one, uh, which was really um, kind of setting the stage uh, of quantum mechanics and how we're going to handle uh, the various things related to, to quantum mechanics that we are going to do in this course. And uh, I think we've made good progress. Uh, we just based uh, everything on the Stengelash experiment, so they're very important to know. Okay, so let's, let's try to, to move on with uh, the summary of chapter one, which is really an extension of, of chapter one. So in quantum mechanics, we have to be careful about intuitive results. Uh, intuitive results turn out to be not so intu intuitive. So how do we, what do we do? Well, the only thing to do is to work so hard in quantum mechanics that your new intuition will become the one related to quantum mechanics. This is the way it works. Quantum mechanics is rooted in experimental evidence that cannot be explained by uh, classical mechanics. So we are really developing a theory because there are experimental data that we cannot explain using classical existing theory. So we do that, and uh, we've, we've actually worked pretty slowly so far, but uh, we, this is a very strong foundation to have mathematical framework to understand what's going on. So we have introduced a new, a new uh, space, a spa quantum space, and uh, it's populated by KET. KET are state vectors, the abstract object that include all the information you could ever get about the quantum system. And we've started to manipulate them. We have manipulated them uh, by introducing the bra that allow us to calculate brackets. And we move on from there. And uh, we are going to find other techniques to work on manipulating them. Actually, next chapter, we'll start to operate on them. And so we are going to introduce the notion of operators. OK, so the quantum state, as I said, we have a bra and a cat, which are which have the same information, they are simply different beasts, they, they live in a different uh, space. Actually, they live in a space and uh, the dual, so it's exactly the same information, but it's, uh, it's, it's just organized differently. Um, that reminds me that uh, next lecture I will uh, uh, explain to you the difference between the primal state and the dual space, and that should give you the, the, the insight why they are equivalent. Okay, so when we combine bra and cats, at least the way we've done it, there are different ways to, to put them together, but the way we've done it so far uh, gives us a scalar, which is a, a probability amplitude, which is a complex number. And uh, what's nice is that the complex conjugate of that number is simply the bracket in the other way, the other, the other, the other order. So the probability amplitude of phi in phi in psi is the complex conjugate of phi in psi. In psi, in psi. That's interesting. The probability itself, of course, is given by the square of the modulus. We've seen that. OK. The very important result, last line, an overall phase factor has no effect on the measurements. In fact, as I mentioned to you, a given cat um, has all the information about the system. Right? Now, if I multiply by a phase factor, I do not change normalization, because a phase factor is simply a complex exponential, so it doesn't change the norm. In fact, it doesn't change any of the bracket I can calculate. Because in any kind of bracket, so using that ket with a phase factor with any other bra on the left-hand side, will not change the square of the amplitude. And the square of the amplitude is the only measurable number that we can have. So in other words, that state that I multiply by a phase factor is exactly the same. It represents exactly the same system. This is the important take-home message. So those two states are exactly equivalent. I like to really insist on this. They are not degenerate. They are the same. OK? They're exactly the same. That's what I, I, I want to, 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 to say. OK. Now, we have done everything in a two-state problem, which is, which is very convenient and, and actually very elegant using the stern galash experiment, since we were working with a spin one-half particle. So the only possible realization of the stern galash experiment was plus one half and minus one half, h bar, h bar, right, for the magnetic moment. But we can go beyond the two-state problem 
In fact, most quantum mechanical problems are, are, are more than two-state problems. And if we have an observable A, and all the possible outcome of the measurement of A, of A are given by A1, A2, A3, and so on and so forth, then we can write any ket as a linear superposition of all the ket that are specific realization of those A1, A2, A3, A4. So, so far we have only looked at two kinds of, of kets, plus z minus z, for example, of plus y minus y plus x minus x. But we could have another kind of measurement where the three possible outcome of the Sturm-Gerlach would be three states, for instance. Okay? Then in that case, we would write everything not only in terms of two, of a basis of, of two vectors, but a basis of n vectors. This is what this notation means. And if we have a general observa observable A, we could write the ket that way, just what I just told you. So it's a linear combination of the, of the ket vectors. And we can calculate the bra by simply inverting the sign and using the complex conjugate, I mean, not the sign, I'm sorry, not, not inverting the sign, inverting the notation of the bra versus ket and uh, introduce complex conjugate instead of the coefficient we had before. And again, the coefficients will be given by the probability amplitude uh, that you can obtain directly by, uh, by uh, operating, uh, applying the bra an on the left hand side of any of the first row, for example. And this is only true because the different observables are orthogonal. So, and this is where we use the Kronecker delta. So what does it mean to be orthogonal? Does th this last line there, the probability amplitude ai aj is equal to delta ij means that the basis uh, is orthogonal. What does that really mean? Well, what it really means is that once I have, uh, if, if I have, for example, a certain super stern gerlach experiment and I have an output A1, I mean, I, have an, I, I take the output A1 from a first stern gerlach experiment and I bring it as an input to a, the same stern gerlach experiment, there is a 100% probability that the output will be A1 but there will be zero probability will be A2, A3, A4. So long if it is exactly the same observable. That's what means experimentally that expression. Okay, so the bra and the cats, of course, we have the same as before. We can write bra and cats. And uh, during the class, I uh, gave you a glimpse of how we can create an identity operator, but we have not seen operators yet. So we'll see that in the next lecture and I will spend a little bit of time Re, um, reminding you where we see the identity operator here on the, on the right hand side. I think that uh, it's pretty obvious already. And you can do the same for the, for the bra. The normalization simply means that the probability of finding a state one, uh, a, a finding, uh, if we have a state, the, pro the, the total probability of that state being that state is one. That's not that surprising. And you can do it uh, by using the bra and the cat. Uh, uh, representation. Again, the expectation values, it's nothing really crazy, the expectation value will be given by the sum of the square, so in other words, the sum of the probabilities times the uh, realization of that measurement. Really nothing different from what we've done for spin, 